who can't afford it. So the people who can afford it, we want to still have them come to us and work with them in a more uh, high-end way. And create a flow of learners. I think that we can also do this while creating a flow of learners into our existing uh, certificate and degree programs. And we also need to recover the investment that's going to take for to offer all this, all the MOOCs and the free educational resources to everybody. So my vision starts with a, the understanding that not all learning outcomes are the same. So you've all seen Bloom's taxonomy or different versions of it. This is the revised version, uh, where the lower level things that people learn are really about knowing stuff and understanding stuff. And then there's application, analyze, evaluation, creation. My point here is not everything is the same level, uh, is demanding at the same level. And MOOCs perhaps play a role in the lower levels of this taxonomy. So if you think about it for a moment, you have that taxonomy, and you might an advanced course. An advanced course might have from every level. An advanced course would have some knowledge that would be in there, some comprehension and the upper levels. But they're not really sort of, you don't do all the knowledge level stuff first. But you learn some things, you understand them, you apply them a little bit, and maybe you move through. And so a typical advanced course in whatever subject might look something like this in terms of the things that people are supposed to learn be able to do. Whereas an introductory course might be more at the lower level kinds of uh, things with just knowledge and, and uh, comprehension. That, I think, is the kind of things that are really in the wheelhouse of a MOOC. I mean, you can it by reading. We do, you can learn it through lectures. We can capture lectures. That's probably the, the MOOC's wheelhouse. Maybe a good advanced course might have you apply something toward the end. Uh, maybe we can or can't do that. Maybe we can do, do that with a little bit of review. When you look at an advanced course, like dissertation research, it's pretty much all at the upper level. But a student may find things that were absent in their preparation that they may need to learn. But that's a whole different ballgame. If you look at the three kinds of courses, you'll see that they're, they're made of many components. I may have overdone it in the introductory course. Maybe there aren't that many things. Mm -hmm. But the idea is there are some clusters of things that we can, we can assemble into badges. You know, we can say these, these things sort of stick together. These, these four things I want to do are about X. So I propose that we take the contents of courses and put those into badgeable kinds of chunks, sequence them, say these are the sequence I'd like to see them happen in. You can do the same for advanced courses, uh, and then you end up with, we can still sell those, those are still three courses that Penn State can offer. So they can have badges in them, and we can give away the badges, we can still call the course. We don't have to choose between badging or courses. Now that we have those uh, badges identified, why not make those available to the world outside Penn State? I'm suggesting here that we take those badges and add them to a content pool uh, that really would be supplemented. So this is just sort of one program's three courses. You would have, have different people doing this. And by the way, not just courses, but if you have an NSF grant on you know, global warming or whatever, they have a dissemination component. Go ahead and use Content Cloud uh, to distribute those things as badgeable chunks of content. So the idea sort of evolves into what, where I see MOOCs going, which is flex MOOC. We all know that MOOCs have a, a big dropout, quote, dropout problem. I use that in quotes because it's not really dropouts because people went there not, not really expecting to finish. But they have a completion problem that I think is related to the fact that not everybody wants to do everything in what we define as a course. And some of them are just curious and they want little pieces of it. So what I see happening is this evolution of this thing called a flex MOOC where people would develop a personalized learning plan. Whoops, and somehow I jumped. I guess this, uh, I must have put more than one finger on my, uh, on my <laughs> trackpad here. So let's jump through this, back to the personalized flex MOOC, personalized learning plan. The so personalized learning plan ends up, I choose which badges go into my learning plan. And at a given time, have three or five in there, but that expands, and that's for a few of things I want to learn. That personalized learning plan, then, I go ahead and start learning first thing, and that first thing might be the lower levels. That be a, might be a knowledge comprehension level kind of thing, which can be tested through an online test. If I pass that test, a badge can automatically be created, and that can go into a portfolio. Either something we, you know, we might provide a, a portfolio app uh, at Penn State, or they might I've used the Mozilla backpack for that. The next thing is more of a high level thing, and that's not really appropriate to be tested. But we can offer that when we're out here in the free space through peer review, 
they pass Q, that ends up in their uh, collection of badges. Here's another low-level piece. If they don't pass that test, it's not a big deal. They can just go back and restudy and take that test again and ultimately pass tests. They can go back and look at what they were doing and pass the test. There's really not much overhead when things can be tested online, and we can make the testing available for you. So here comes another one. That's the test. I don't even know why I did that one. I should get that out to make it quicker. Here's another high-level thing, and they don't pass a peer review. Now, that's a problem of sorts in that the peer review thing works because if you have two people review your work, you have to review at least two people's work. So if you fail it the first time, then your, your debt goes up. You owe four reviews, but you still have to go ahead and do it again. But once you pass it, you would be queued for four reviews. The idea here is you don't review until you pass it. So this is a whole free system, and I would go back around through that, and I would end up with a collection of badges. Now, that collection of badges can be uh, displayed in collection. So this is one sort of big, that's everything I've got. But you're going to want the ability to display those as collections. So you'd be able to take this portfolio and make collections of badges, and maybe I say these six badges are related to, you know, instructional design, and these two are related specifically to task analysis. Uh, I can produce reports from that, and those reports then can be used for prior learning assessment. So prior learning assessment, we'll talk, I'll talk about that briefly in a moment, is a key to two different kinds of credit. There's credit for things like continuing education units, that are really based on time, and they're really sort of low-level, low-verification, low-grade credentials. And we can do that. We can have assessments for that, except a small processing fee and do that. <clears throat> but now you've got this set of badges that was in introductory course. Now, if I have a set of badges that's equivalent to that set of badges, I might not want just CEUs. I might want course credit for that. So <clears throat> two options are credit by examination and credit by portfolio. So if it's credit by examination, in other words, if it's knowledge level stuff, a lot of the stuff at the low level, that can be tested. And if I don't pass it, no big deal. I get to brush up and try again. If I do pass it, though, I should be able to get some credit that would apply to my transcript. It gets a little trickier when we're talking about the higher order stuff, the stuff high on those hierarchies, because you really do need a review. Now, you've already had peer review. And the assignments were the exact same assignments that were in my course. So a lot of the problems with credit by portfolio go away because that's usually somebody giving you a portfolio that doesn't have comparable things to what you were looking for. But if you designed the tasks, they did those tasks, they were reviewed by peers who aren't experts, but they probably already brushed some things up or uh, you, know, you, you know that they, there's some degree of quality there. That should expedite the portfolio review process. Now they'll be paying us more money for that because that's very labor intensive. So the current plan at Penn State is about $390. Uh, that's all right. It's about $390 for up to six credits. So that can still represent about a 10 to 20 percent, whether it's three credits or six credits, of the cost of taking the exact course. So then, if you you know if you pass that peer review, that should go on your transcript. If not, again, you can come back around. So all of those credits, then now I end up with credits that I got inexpensively and on my own that can be applied to degrees, certificates, and transcripts. So that increases the odds that I, first of all, I'm going to know about Penn State's degree. I'm going to have be X percent of the way there, say 20, 30, 40 percent of the way there, before I come in to get those things that are really high up on, the, on that uh, hierarchy, that taxonomy. So the key components of this are competency-based learning. You have to know what you care about. Uh, that means well-defined learning outcomes and assessments that are real. So there's some cost to us because I don't think all of our courses are, are designed well enough to really uh, do that yet. There's a digital badging component with peer assess, sort of I'm calling those like bronze level. Somebody can do that. They can still use that badge to claim some knowledge. But then there's our Penn State assess, a gold level badge that they can use that should have more uh, weight in terms of other people's uh, perception of those badges. And then there's prior learning assessment. But Pat Schoep and I agree that the word prior, is, which is always associated with that, really isn't really accurate for a lot of the things. This is learning that just happened, right? And learning that happened purposefully in order to meet this course. So it's not the same thing as saying, well, you have X years of work experience, so we're going to give you a bunch of credits. Now, this is actually competency-based 
assessment of learning that has taken place, uh, whether it's prior or you know, just in time for this. And then what we're going to need is MOOC style peer review and peer support tools. So the good news is a lot of those tools are evolving rapidly outside of Penn State, and we should be able to apply those to our system. So I, I just in closing, I want to say the stuff we're doing now, the time-based stuff, that came out in 1906. And just, you know, 1906, that's when this was aviation, right, and, the, and where the fire department in San Francisco basically was responsible for much of the destruction because fire departments were starting to use dynamite, and that actually exacerbated things. So this time-based system that we're in was something created, you know, back then. And we shouldn't necessarily think that this is the thing that's going to carry us forward. Maybe we need some new approaches like that. That's where I'll stop. And we'll, uh, I'll, uh, I don't know, uh, rather than taking questions down, maybe we'll let Chris present his approach and then open the whole thing up. I have uh, Firefox now on here. Okay. So I don't know if that'll work. Uh, you might still need a, uh, why don't you try to share your screen? And if that, let me, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen. And then you can try to share your screen. And if it works, great. Okay. So I stopped sharing. You should see a start uh, sharing. Nothing is being shared, is all I have here. Did you make it? Because I changed browsers. Uh, you, you have to make me. User, me yeah, okay, he'll, he'll bring you in as a different okay. user. In the meantime, I'll try and open it on mine in case we have to yep. come back to that. Yeah. And I don't know how it'll work all with back. the sound. Okay. All right, share you my should screen. Have the Share my screen, connecting, yes. <clears throat> that works for me. I'm sharing. All right, let me can share my screen again. Desktop, I choose desktop, right? There. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, now I'm wondering, I'm going to have to turn the sound on on, on my uh, system here. And there may be feedback. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, let me escape out of this. And I have to mute myself on the, do I need to mute myself yeah, on? Just mute your speakers. Uh, Okay, yeah, that's good. You'll probably be all right with just the. Oh, okay. So you, as they are, yeah. you think I should do? All right, great. Let's try it. Uh, I'm going back here. All right. So this uh, this idea here is um, to uh, see if we could do a little bit of a different model with um, MOOCs and generate a little bit of revenue uh, by combining them with a uh, multi uh, massively open. Uh, or let me it should be called massively online uh, credit course, so a mock. Uh, and um, the idea here was uh, to see what could be done. So I'm going to just do a quick outline of what we uh, are thinking about here, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll have questions for both Kyle and you. So thanks for everybody for for being here. Um, so the course that we're going to look at is a course called Presumed Innocent, and it's a sociology course. Uh, that is um, going to have social science content to it. So the, the credit is really going to be, the idea is going to be to create a general education social science course uh, and to see if we could deliver it at scale uh, for credit for a reduced cost of tuition. So let's talk a little bit about how that's going to work. Here's the, here's the movie. Is anybody hearing that? That's the problem. I'm not hearing it. Okay, turn on turn on your speakers. Sorry. Okay, turn the speakers. On. I'm gonna go back. All right. Okay. Give as much volume as can. So we have to turn our speakers off. All right, hold on. Let me let me pause that. All right, hold on. Turn it again, okay? Now I'm going to come on. Okay, now my speakers are on. All right. Still a little bit of feedback.
Okay, so uh, awesome, dramatic, <laughs> tremendous video uh, that you missed. But anyway, you'll you'll be if you want to take the course, it'll be a massively open online course this summer available to you. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the uh, decisions we made early on uh, in thinking about this. Why the summer? Uh, because summer gives us a little bit more stability with regard to tuition and how we uh, charge tuition. Uh, if we did in the fall and the spring, we would be really locked into tuition tables and, and all of that. Um, why sociology? Well, we're concerned about uh, what this uh, experiment, it's really a pilot, is going to do and mean for the campuses. We, we, don't, we know that campuses don't have a lot of sociology uh, programs uh, going on. We thought about psychology as a, one of the options for this because we needed a course that was uh, going to be popular. Uh, but we also know that campuses have psychology courses going on all the time in the summer. So we didn't really, we, didn't, we, we thought it would be unfair to uh, mount a cheaper summer uh, course uh, to a massive scale and open to both Penn State students and non-Penn State students. So, so we, we chose sociology for that. What are the kinds of things we're testing? Well, we want to know if we can offer a high-quality instruction and educational experience at scale. We want to see what happens uh, with a discounting tuition situation, if we can att attract net new students to the uh, online uh, program, both to uh, increase revenue of possibilities in the summer, but, but then also, hopefully, we have a modern sociology. This would feed. Uh, possibly as the, the MOOC part of it might feed, uh, feed some uh, enrollments to sociology and sociology minor or other minor uh, majors that we have in the social science side of things uh, on the world campus. Um, and of course, we just want to learn and see about what, what we're going to learn about online education in the process. So this is how it's going to uh, work a little bit. Well, we have uh, course components. Uh, the things on the, I guess, on the left of the screen there uh, are shared between the MOOC and the, and the mock, uh, video, lecture content, some, some quizzes, and discussions, discussion forms. But then there will be a portion of the course that is uh, bracketed off and segregated off, uh, and that will have additional readings, readings that might be copyrighted. It will have uh, uh, student projects. Uh, that are more uh, robust in them. They'll have more rigorous assignments. Obviously, we're going to try and offer three credits, so it has to get those credits worth of work in there. And then uh, the thing I'm particularly excited about is we're going to, we're going to hire a uh, small army of undergraduate uh, <laughs> and graduate uh, teach, teaching assistants, probably in a kind of tiered system with the graduate teaching assistants uh, supervising the undergraduate teaching assistants. Uh, to see if we can um, really get more than just a kind of peer review uh, experience with regard to the evaluation of, of content in the, um, in the credit course. It's something we do uh, for our 700 person um, Social 119 course, the uh, uh, course that Sam Richards teaches. So we, we have a lot of experience with that over in sociology, and we have a, we have a cohort of, of undergraduates who've been trained for that. So, we're hoping that, that to integrate that, and that's another part of this, to see how that could be uh, brought into this, this model. So how is this going to work? Well, uh, we're going to have a kind of situation where you're going to everybody sign up for the MOOC, and uh, then in the first six weeks, you will have people who kind of continue with the MOOC. They can complete the MOOC. They'll drop out of the MOOC, as we know people will do. Uh, and then those who complete it, they'll earn their certificate with all the things on the bottom of the certificate that says this piece of paper is worth barely what it's printed on. But in any case, uh, you, you've done something. Uh, for those who uh, sign up for credit at, uh, at, at a certain point in the, in early on in the course, they'll sign up. Uh, we'll register them. We'll talk a minute just about that. Um, we, they will complete uh, the coursework uh, with a more robust information and more robust assignments, then they'll receive a grade and they'll receive three credits for the course. So my final slide here is about open questions. There probably people have a number of questions, but we have a number of open questions about this. What delivery platform are we going to use? We are probably, we're thinking about staying away from Coursera on this one. 
uh, and hoping that a reduced tuition rate will draw people. Uh, we're, we're, I'm going from this meeting to a meeting with Blackboard uh, to see if that if their platform can be used. So we may be uh, looking at that. Um, the reduced tuition rate is going to be uh, at the military rate level, which is something like $920 or something like that. So um, it's pretty much the lowest tuition we offer. Um, for a gen ed course, I think it'll be an enticing thing. Uh, the, another open question is how are we going to manage student information? Uh, uh, how are we going to register people? How are we going to verify, and this goes to the academic integrity point, how are we going to verify that the people who are there are doing the work? Um, so all of those things are things we're thinking about, uh, and if you want to press me on them, uh, you can, but I don't have a lot of answers at the moment. <laughs> at the moment. Um, so that's really the, that, that's really the model for, uh, for this MOOC mock uh, experiment, grand experiment in the summer. So we already have one question from, uh, from Larry Reagan. Uh, uh, how did you go about actually getting that reduced tuition rate? <laughs> uh, good question, Larry. Um, well, I know people. <laughs> um, actually, it was, uh, it, you know, this whole thing came kind of about when in conversation with um, Craig uh, Weideman and, um, and Susan Welch, and, the, uh, and so we just said we, uh, he, in fact, actually, he approached us, are we willing to experiment with this, and we came up with this model. Um, uh, Rachel Smith in the budget office took some uh, convincing. And, I, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure that it's finally been approved that we're going to get this reduced rate. Is he hearing me? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. I was, right. A bank rolling. Yeah, that's right. I got a credit card right here. We're just going to, well, you know all the money we make on the world campus. We're just funneling back in. But actually, I think the, the you know, even if we spend, so if we're making, let's just say $1,000 a, a, a student on this. Um, if we get a thousand students, we'll definitely be covering our costs, you know. But uh, if we can get a thousand students, that would be pretty, pretty, pretty significant. So I think we're going to get that many. But faculty, Senate, Department, College approvals. Um, yeah, I don't want to steal Kyle's thunder. I want to let <laughs> these are going. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm interested in your faculty senate approval uh, is coming. We're uh, we're approving getting the course just a general education course um, in through faculty senate this spring. Um, whenever I've tried to talk about delivery methods in terms of uh, course approval with the curriculum committee, nobody they want to be delivery agnostic. So I'm kind of um, just letting that still be the case because this course is a course, and so it's not. I mean, it's going to be a rigorous, you know, sociology course that we could offer anyway. Um, getting the department to buy in was uh, was was the head had to be convinced that this is you know real value. We had to buy a, you know one of his faculty members out of the out of the out of a course, a couple courses in the spring, and get him to be able to develop it. Um, the college was kind of driving it, so we just did it. <laughs> Susan, Susan Welch has been on board, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited to just try it. I made something different. Chris, if you're not going to go the Coursera route, Coursera's eyeballs, right? Yeah. So, so how, how are you going to go about kind of promoting yeah. something like this? Uh, not going yeah, so that's one of the things. We've been thinking a lot about which is uh, which is um, marketing. Um, once we have the um, tuition finalized, and once we have you know some of the assets with regard to the videos, um, I think we're, gonna, uh, we're, we're working with WPA to try to to figure out a, uh, a little bit of a marketing plan to make this you know to get this out there, and then to see about. Um, uh,
a tool that's right for different programs yeah, for different purposes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm also myself in the issue of um, the learning experience on the undergraduate TA side. So what, what kind of experiences are we, uh, are we giving these students who are TAing this class? That's a, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to teach into that experience, maybe even to offer credit for that. Uh, depend, so there, there's another side of it that where we where we could give them that, giving them 400 level sociology credit, which we do do for our, some of our TAs in sociology. So that's another actually way, uh, theoretically, of, of of generating revenue, but also of giving students really a high level credential for the job market and other and other things. So Larry asked uh, for both of you. <clears throat> Given all the thought you've put into both of your approaches and what you're going to be offering, what what's risen to the surface as your biggest concern? What, what are you most worried about? <laughs> you want to go first? You want me to think yeah, about you go ahead. You go first. So I have thought about that. My concern is it's a whole lot of work. I mean, so to, to do what I talked about, you have to really define carefully what it is you care about. And you have to... Uh, teach that, you know, pr produce learning resources that will work, and you have to assess it really well. And, uh, you know, I, I think that in a lot of courses, we're not really there. You know, we have, we're still operating at that 1906 seat time kind of a theory, where if we wash them for 18 weeks in, in the glow of our, uh, you know, our presence and our content, then they're going to graduate with what we want. So to me, the, the, my greatest fear is it's a lot of work. And we're going to need, Penn State has over 100 instructional designers, but we're going to need a whole bunch more. And so are the rest of the universities around the country because competency-based learning is coming. Uh, it is, you know, increasing in prominence, and that is sort of the next wave. And so another related concern is it's a lot of work, and there aren't enough professionals who are ready to help move all the existing courses into competency-based models. Yeah. I bought you enough time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not so worried about the work because other people are doing the work, like, <laughs> Kathy, like Kathy and Kate Miffin and, and, and Tim Robichaud, who's doing a lot of our teaching and who's developing the course. Um, I'm worried uh, uh, about, well, something very practical is we're going to build this thing nobody will show up, right? Well, we could have given a 30-person uh, course to a, you know, on campus, and that would have been kind of sad, especially if... Um, you know, the Chronicle somehow figures this out and decides to cover it or something, and we get, they, oh, well, look what, you know, Penn State's done a, a big experiment here, and it's failed. I don't worry that much about that in the sense that, that we admit this is an experiment, we're, we're trying, and failure is part of that uh, endeavor. The other thing I worry about more, um, uh, I worry about more from an institutional perspective um, and just to be candid, is that the model that we're putting out there is one that is um, really getting into some issues with regard to the campus university park relationship and and its relationship to world campus. That to me is um, the set of tensions that the university needs to address at some level at some point. And, and uh, the reason why I say that with regard to this point is, of course, we're doing this in the summer. But um, if this thing is really successful, we'll be pulling students from all over the university, wherever campus they're at, wherever the campus they are in. Um, that kind of ha happens already in summer with regard to our world campus courses and some of our our online courses that we do, but, but I think it's going to, you know, uh, every, liberal arts always gets into trouble. We always get into trouble because we have, <laughs> we, you know, we have a discipline and everything <laughs> in all the campuses. Everybody has English. Everybody has everybody has psychology, and so when we try to do stuff, there breeds can breed resentment, and I, and I and I want to avoid that. I don't really, you know, that's not the intent. We're trying to do in. in Know innovative things and do some interesting things, but um, but I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit worried about that. So I have a uh, question: <clears throat> Would you consider your your uh, move a flex move? And, and if so, are you have you had any talks with uh, with Kyle about piloting his badges idea? 
Uh, we haven't had any conversations other than this one. Right. Um, I would, to I mean, I'm, uh, we're thinking about badging and uh, a lot of different areas in liberal arts, and I would love to, to and we're, we're partnering with, we're going to use the, the badge system that's been developed. Um, I think for this particular project in this, this summer, We've got enough things we're trying, <laughs> um, but I think we, we definitely would, I mean, I'd love to work with Kyle about thinking about something down the line where we could do something like that because, uh, um, you know, you know it, from my perspective, we just learn by trying these things and we'll figure out what works and what doesn't work, you know. Right. We'll we maybe blow a few things up in the process, but, <laughs> but hopefully nothing will get really <laughs> badly destroyed. <laughs> What do you think about leveraging, uh, Lynn just asked, what do you think about leveraging some of the students from other campuses so that other campuses are included yeah. as, as your TAs and, and like? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think, you know, we, you know reaching out and, and partnering. One, one of the issues, the problems with, I don't know if it's a problem, but the facts of how the world campus grew up um, is that uh, well, I, I mean, our college, because the dean, was, you know, saw this as something important to get up behind early on, uh, we developed infrastructure to build courses, and 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 now we're kind of like a bit of bit like the 800-pound gorilla in the room. But it didn't just happen. I mean, that you know, that was a vision and that was hard work that happened. Um, but because of the way the world campus works with regard, well, if you once you stake your claim in the in the ground about the discipline and the degree program, then you know, then it's kind of yours. I think the a real strength of the world campus is that it's rooted in academic units. Uh, that has to continue, obviously. Um, but we are going to have to have a, a conversation as a, co a university. We're going to have to have leadership from the president and the provost ultimately on how is this constellation going to work itself out? University park campuses, world campus. It's a, it's a, it's a delicate dance. <laughs> so I'm speaking of a delicate dance, I may be asking you and Pat to do one now. Oh, okay. Because I, I see, uh, I see that Jack Matson said, so non-Penn State students get Penn State credit without being accepted. Interesting. Accepted? Question mark. Interesting. And I, I had said, so high school students can high school yeah. students mm -hmm. do this? And then my, my question for Pat is, so I'll let you mm -hmm. think about that, and then we'll maybe we'll pass it to Pat. Because one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, right now that prior learning assessment option, the credit by exam or credit by portfolio, is really only open to people who are in, have already been accepted to a degree program. Now, ideally, I think they would be more likely to enter a degree program after they have amassed a certain number of credits. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you answer that, mm -hmm. and then I'll let you, I'll come back to you for a uh, thing about, do you think that it's possible that we might at some point expand beyond that, you have to be in a degree. Yeah, Chris. so so uh, I don't think it's a big uh, problem because people already, uh, non-degree students already can do that. They can take credit uh, for, I mean, they can take courses for credit. They're just not, they're registered as non-degree. And that's how we would be registering them. Um, so I don't see, I don't, and maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think that's uh, going to be a huge problem. Um, we're just going to be, I mean, the problem is going to be if we have thousands of people to all of a sudden register for this course, to get them all registered non-degree and get them into the system. So they will be in the system. Um, they just won't be accepted into Penn State in that, in that uh, official way until they go through that process. Um, with regard to prior learning, with regard to learning assessment, whether prior or not, um, you know, well, I've, Pat and I have been on this prior learning assessment committee, and, and I, one of the things that has actually been, we've proposed out of that is to have a portfolio writing course, um, which it would be a three credit course and would probably, would probably have a writing component to it, independent of the credit by portfolio process so that um, and 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 the issue would be is if the university decides to, to make that course the required course for any future credit by portfolio to ensure that we have a kind of regular uh, and rigorous set of expectations about what a portfolio should look like then how does that fit into something like this and could that could that course and we're trying we would like that course to integrate badges itself into it and would students be able to test out of that course? 
Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> All right. okay. But so I, it would be interesting to hear how that fits into it. Matt, did, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think Chris did a good job of explaining the difference. Um, this particular model requires uh, students to register, and they're paying, and there's additional assignments, and there's additional assessment. So it's just like a non-Penn State student signing up for a course. Um, the flip side of that, what you were um, talking about, Kyle, is if this was a regular MOOC, that it was free and there was no additional assignments or additional assessment, um, then that's where it would butt up against our current policy of not doing assessment for non-Penn State students. So this is a different animal and it, and it fits into our current policy. Mm -hmm. My animal doesn't. No, your animal. Yeah, yeah, that's why. That's why. Yeah, you're yeah. like more of a monster. Your animal needs a monster. Right, monster. <laughs> yeah. No, a good monster. A bureaucratic <laughs> monster. I, I'll, yeah. I'll accept that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stevie, was that Stevie asking about uh, the other fees? Mm -hmm. I was hoping, Stevie, that we would uh, that we we would just get one flat rate. That we would just say, you know, nine ninety nine, take the class, or however, you know, nine nine hundred twenty bucks. That's it. Flat rate. Everybody come, and if and if we need to somehow, you know, well, I, I'm should I even say this? If we need to somehow share the revenue out to support the infrastructure, then we could probably figure out a way. If we if we can make it rain money here with this thing, <laughs> there should be enough to share. <laughs> We've never edited these uh, coil conversations, but, but we but this no. will be the first one that we have to. Oh, that you said this is public. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, editing myself, but I no, you know, it's not. It, it's something that we should, we should, we really need to think about with regard to, you know, how how do we get people to come, um, to come to do it? You know, I, I I think if we just say, well, come take this course for the same amount that you pay for any other course, just nobody's going to get crickets. And so and so back to your rain money thing. I, I think that's not really bad. I mean, some people have predicted that what we're going to see is a few very large players. You know, we're going to see mega universities develop, and they're going to be the ones that have status and have technological abilities and have vision. So, you know, what what you really mean, you know, if we if it rains students and yeah. we have opportunity yeah. to really expand and do things and, and cover our costs and all that, then you know, I think that's that's potentially a very good thing. And, yeah. and I think that you know, it might be wise for us to try and yeah. create uh, some at least niches in which we can right. create. Uh, Massive influx of, of credit students. Yeah, and I mean, I you know, I'm saying that tongue in cheek about the raining money, but my, because the thing that excites me about this model is the things I was mentioning, namely can, the opportunities for undergraduate teaching assistants to, and, and graduate teaching assistants to really be engaged at a massive scale. Can we really roll that out? That actually can have significant impact on graduate education for us, and it could really, I mean, it, it can integrate the undergraduate and the graduate. Uh, uh, modes of education at a big place like this. I mean, it seems like it, it, there's a lot of opportunity there. And we're always looking for places to support graduate students, exactly. for funding to support exactly. graduate students. Right. So that model I have, those portfolio reviews of undergraduate courses can be done by graduate students. Right. So now we have a source to fund our graduate programs. And That's right. That's it seems right. like a win-win. Exactly. Yep. Anything else? I see. So Cole's now taking this. Oh boy, this is. Which Cole do we? Yeah, have? I don't know who's that. Who? Who's the, who? Which I Cole is Cole. that? I see Cole. Oh, That's Cole, Cole Campbell. Nice. Uh, I thought he was at a different university. He is. It's open, like I said. <laughs> Good to see you, Cole. It's it's great to have you with us. <laughs> Wonderful. Fred has a question for us. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm. I'm thinking we're going to grab um, students at Penn State who are home working. Uh, we're going to grab uh, and also students from the campuses who are home, who are wherever they are working, and they get. Ooh, they see any. You know, this class is available and cheaper. Let's get on, jump on that. So we'll get. We'll be getting some of those Penn State students, and I. But the question is, where are we going to get the net new students? And that's the interesting question. I am hoping that it could be high school students, people wanting to go, getting ready to go to college, 
uh, saying, hmm, wow, I'm going to get gen three general education credits from Penn State. Penn State, that should transfer no problem, you know. Um, and it will show that on the transcript. So uh, I'm thinking that those students may be, and uh, students from any university uh, um, who just needs three more gen ed credits for their program wherever they are. So we're, we're hoping to, uh, you know, particularly at Stony Brook, you know, we're hoping <laughs> they'll be taking some classes over here. That's a, that's a good point. I think, I think parents who can see, if my high school kids can get some credits out of the way, maybe they'll be able to graduate in four right. or five years instead of five or six years. Right. So yeah. I think that should be very attractive. You're going for a different demographic than, uh, I mean, I've been looking at the Coursera data for a while, and it's, yeah. you know, past bachelor's degree, 35-year-old, uh, you know, right. non-native English people that are completing those courses. So it's a, the marketing thing, and I think you're right, is an interesting, right. an interesting challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna be, yeah. And wh where are we going to send, where, where are we going to, you know, do these ads and things like that? Coursera doesn't really advertise the market to well, that's why when we when we it, when we choose to go outside of Coursera, we're basically turning down that kind of flow that we get just from being in Coursera. So we talked about it, but I don't think that they there is a way of of um, segregating. I think within Coursera, but it, I think there's a, the the uh, Blackboard uh, apparently is going to be able to give us a much more robust experience with regard to the higher level learning that we want to, to, to offer students. But we'll find out in a, you know soon when I go over there and hear what they have to say. <laughs> yeah, well, another interesting set of developments is that Google is working with edX to create a more learner-centered MOOC platform. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see what evolves out of that partnership as well. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, this space is completely transit in transition and, and um, you know, the, you, you all know more than I do about exactly what these different plat platforms can do. So, Chris, um, how will this be still in the transcript? It will the be. Students who get the credit. Yeah, how it'll be that? called uh, SOCH, whatever number we give it, and then um, uh, presume uh, the title will be presumed innocent, and will count for if we get it approved by the Senate General Social Science Credit. So there won't be any new. No, it'll just be credit, right? I mean, so we're not, we're not, we're we're only giving credit for the mock part of it, which is going to be a rigorous course that is worth three credits. It's not going to be, uh, it's just going to be delivered to hopefully a lot of people. In our prior learning assessment realm, those are the kinds of conversations that we've been having. We don't currently, as policy, accept MOOCs from other universities. We don't accept them. Not uh, rigorous. There hasn't been that assessment, um, and that's not a problem. If we know that it's a MOOC, but we're looking at what other universities are doing, and they're not coding them on transcripts, as MOOCs, or they're talking about that, so we would have trouble not differentiating something that went through our admissions, whether it was a course that a student took <coughs> for credit, or whether it was a MOOC. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Thing that we have to be paying Yeah. Well, I guess from my perspective, we're not going to give credit for something that's not worth credit. So that's what that's one of the things we're taking ownership of in doing this. So when we say you're getting three credits for this, it's because you did three credits worth of academic work. And so in a way, it's not it's no longer a MOOC in that traditional right. sense at that point. Right. You know, we're just we're delivering right. a credit course at a massive scale. Or maybe to 35 people. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's 35 the first time. So yeah, exactly. You have to understand those things. Right. Will, it could, will right. Run. Exactly. Yeah, yeah and I, hopefully the content is compelling enough that we'll, we'll get some people going. So, final question I think as, as we're running out of time, we started about five minutes late. But uh, Jack Matson asks, you know, what, what exactly do you mean by rigorous? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what's the rubric? Who's, who's doing all the, the analysis? I think mm -hmm. you touched upon mm -hmm. some of this already. Yeah. So, uh, so Tim Robicho is the faculty member in uh, sociology who's responsible for uh, developing the content of the, of the course, but he's also tapping into the, 
um, uh, a lot of the tenure line faculty in sociology, they're going to be participating in this with regard to some of the videos and things and helping consult on um, the rubrics that we're using to assess the, uh, to assess the assignments, um, how we're training our undergraduate uh, and graduate teaching assistants who are doing the grading. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to um, assess the rigor of this course in the same way that we assess, you know, the rigor of our regular courses, uh, you know, face-to-face -face courses that are relatively large courses. I mean, we're, we're, we're delivering econ courses, 800 students, you know, at a time, and, and of course, there's 119, and there's all kinds of big courses that we have going on campus. So I, I, I think we'll be able to handle that. Philosophical, the philosophical question about what rigor is, that's a different question. I'm happy to talk about that at some point, too. But <laughs> No, Fred, I'm good. Yeah, thanks, Fred. There's Brad. Yeah. He's the guy, man behind the mic that you hear and all the rest of this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So this will be, uh, it has been recorded and it will be posted on the COIL website. So if you, if there anybody else you think might want to see this, you can tell them to go to the COIL website. And Cole Campley's, thank you for joining us. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, the things on the, I guess on the left of the screen there, uh, are shared between the MOOC and the, and the mock. Uh, video, lecture content, some some quizzes and discussions discussion forms. But then there will be a portion of the course that is uh, bracketed off and segregated off, uh, and that will have additional readings, readings that might be copyrighted. It will have uh, uh, student projects uh, that are more uh, robust in them. They'll have more rigorous assignments. Obviously, we're going to turn off for three credits, so it has to get those credits worth of work in there. And then uh, the thing I'm particularly excited about is we're going to, we're going to hire a uh, small army of undergraduate uh, and graduate uh, teach, teaching assistants, probably in a kind of tiered system with the graduate teaching assistants uh, supervising the undergraduate teaching assistants, uh, to see if we can um, really get more than just a kind of peer review uh, experience with regard to the evaluation of of content in the um, in the credit course, it's something we do uh, for our 700 person um, social 119 course, the uh, uh, course that Sam Richards teaches. So we, we have a lot of experience with that over in sociology, and we have a we have a cohort of, of undergraduates who've been trained for that. So we're hoping that that to integrate that, and that's another part of this to see how that could be uh, brought into this this model. So how is this going to work? Well. Uh, we're going to have a kind of situation where you're going to everybody sign up for the MOOC, and uh, then in the first six weeks, you will have people who kind of continue with the MOOC. They can complete the MOOC. They'll drop out of the MOOC, as we know people will do. Uh, and then those who complete it, they'll earn their certificate with all the things on the bottom of the certificate that says this piece of paper is worth barely what it's printed on. But in any case, uh, you, you've done something. Uh, for those who uh, sign up for credit at, uh, at, at a certain point in the, in early on in the course, they'll sign up. Uh, we'll register them. We'll talk a minute just about that. Um, we, they will complete uh, the coursework uh, with the more robust I information and more robust assignments. And then they'll receive grade and they'll receive three credits for the course. So my final slide here is about open questions. There probably people have a number of questions, but we have a number of open questions about what delivery platform are we going to use. We are probably we're thinking about staying away from Coursera on this one, uh, and hoping that a reduced tuition rate will draw people. Uh, we're, we're I'm going from this meeting to a meeting with Blackboard uh, to see if that if their platform can be used. So we may be uh, looking at that. Um, the reduced tuition rate is going to be uh, at the military rate level, which is something like $920 or something like that. So um, it's pretty much the lowest tuition we offer. Um, for a gen ed course, I think it'll be an enticing thing. Uh, the, another open question is, how are we going to manage student information? Uh, uh, how are we going to register people? 
how are we going to verify, and this goes to the academic integrity point, how are we going to verify that the people who are there are doing the work? Um, so all of those things are things we're thinking about, uh, and if you want to press me on them, uh, you can, but I don't have a lot of answers at the moment. <laughs> at the moment. Um, so that, that's, really the, that, that's really the model for, uh, for this MOOC mock uh, experiment, grand experiment in the summer. So we already have one question from, uh, from Larry Reagan. Uh, how did you go about actually getting that reduced tuition rate? <laughs> uh, good question, Larry. Um, well, I know people. <laughs> um, actually, it was, uh, it, you know, this whole thing came kind of about when in conversation with um, Craig uh, Weideman and, um, and Susan Welch, and, uh, and so we just said we, uh, he, in fact, actually, he approached us, are we willing to experiment with this, and we came up with this model. Um, uh, Rachel Smith in the budget office took some uh, convincing. And, I, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure that it's finally been approved that we're going to get this reduced rate. Is he hearing me? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. I was, right. I'm bankrolling. Yeah, that's right. I got a credit card right here. We're just going <laughs> to. Well, you know all the money we make on the world campus. We're just funneling it back in. But actually, I think the, the you know, even if we spend, so if we're making, let's just say $1,000 a, a, a student on this, um, if we get 1,000 students, we'll definitely be covering our costs, you know. But uh, if we can get 1,000 students, that would be pretty, pretty, pretty significant. So I, I don't think we're going to get that. But. Faculty Senate Department College Approvals. Um, yeah, I don't want to steal Kyle's thunder. I want to let him use our card. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm interested in your if faculty senate approval uh, is coming. We're uh, we're approving getting the course approved as a, just a general education course um, in through the faculty senate this spring. Um, whenever I've tried to talk about delivery methods in terms of uh, course approvals with the curriculum committee, nobody they want to be delivery agnostic. So I'm kind of. Um, just letting that still be the case because this course is a course, and so it's not. I mean, it, it's going to be a rigorous, you know, sociology course that we could offer anyway. Um, getting the department to buy in was uh, was was it had to be convinced that this is you know a real value. We had to buy it, you know, one faculty members out of the, out of the out of a course, a couple courses this spring, and get them to be able to develop it. Um, the college was kind of driving it, so we just approved it. <laughs> Susan, Susan Welch has been on board, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited to just try. I mean, just try something different. Chris, if you're not going to go the Coursera route, Coursera is eyeballs, right? Yeah. So, so how, how are you going to go about kind of promoting yeah. something like this? Uh, yeah, so that's one of the things we've been thinking a lot about, which is uh, which is um, marketing. Um, once we have the um, tuition finalized, and once we have you know some of the assets with regard to the videos, um, I think we're gonna uh, we're, we're working with WBSU to try to to figure out a uh, a little bit of a marketing plan to make this you know to get this out there and then to see about. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be one of these, you know, get a general education, uh, three general education credits for cheaper, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, very instrumental, <laughs> uh, you know, buy one, get one free kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> or get one free and buy one. I don't know how this works, <laughs> how this works with MOOCs and mocks. But yeah, we're going to have to have, we're going to have a plan for, for that. Uh, and, and I think my understanding, and I don't have a huge understanding of Coursera, but my understanding is that there's some some significant uh, limits on it. Do you want? It says if I have a microphone, when I ask questions, I would just audio. Yeah, I was just telling them. Yeah, yeah. Good. Rather than going through the thing. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. But there there is a question as as to the automated grading. Uh, what type of platform software? What are you thinking of using for that? Well, so we're think we're that's we're gonna meet in an hour or whenever and at noon for uh, with Blackboard, and so those are the kinds of questions that we're gonna be uh, asking. 
our designers and in liberal arts that's there were we're sort of taking the lead on to the design of the course and we have those questions but we've but we've got the support of 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 Craig's office and they basically said that for this if they have to manually register each person that's what we're going to have to do to because it's a pilot and we're going to have to try to figure that out so i mean i think one of the big worries is regi just reg how how are people we're going to get into our system and in the in the regular moves they're just not they never touch our system you know so that's going to be a significant issue but blackboard my understanding is that blackboard will be able to deal with that kind of scale this this i forget what the the blackboard uh, learn learning space or learns something. their normal one i don't know if they have a special move yeah i think they have a special set aside for moves yeah. and yeah so are are because I, I wanted to ask uh, Kyle a question about the. Oh, Kathy's on. Well, Kathy's Kathy should be answering questions. About <laughs> How are you feeling, Kathy? How did I did I do okay? <laughs> now she's typing. <laughs> Meanwhile, as Kathy's typing, maybe I could ask Kyle. One of the things I was wondering about your model is the issue of 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 co of of coherence of the curriculum of that. So. Um, are you envisioning for certain components of the curriculum that we have a kind of meta badge situation where we can require, you know, not just a, a kind of collection of various learning experiences, but actually a, a sequenced and tiered experience in some of these? Because some of those, and even the introductory level, we had to have that. Yeah. So I, I'm seeing the the badging covering the knowledge and comprehension level things and some application and other higher order things, and I'm I'm guessing that often. When it comes time to award credit, it may be a three-credit course, but we may want to divide it into uh, you know one credit that's purely knowledge and comprehension. If it turns out that people can usually pass that without you know on first try kinds of things, so I anticipate say there were ten badges that make this three-credit course. Mm -hmm. Somebody on portfolio review or four of those badges might be testable. So automated testing, boom, you get credit for four of those ten things. Then the portfolio. I look at that and I'm like, oh, you got another three, right. uh, but there might still be three things left. So I'm, we might go say, well, you've got two credits worth of this, but for the third credit, we need to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So what I see there is you know, they'll, they'll have to submit again for a portfolio review. So they do the first time, they, they've paid the $390 and their credits are reviewed. And from that, they get two thirds of the credits, but that third, they're going to have to submit again. Mm -hmm. now, I'm hoping. And I don't know, and I'm looking at Pat Shope, our, our prior learning assessment expert here. That I'm hoping that you might be there might be another rate for a reaction because I think they're going to need to pay again if they submit again. Uh, but I want that based on okay, so there's three credits left, so that 390 goes down to 30 percent of 390 mm -hmm. uh, on the second review, or maybe even less because yeah. I've already looked at most of it. The third go round, the second go round is going to be less expensive. Right. So. I really one of the things I wonder about is how soon higher grades going to move to a pay for what you use kind of a model. Yeah. In other words, the the, the courses that can be automated grading. Now I know that's a big source of revenue for universities, so it's controversial. Mm -hmm. But the courses where you're requiring a lot of resource are probably going to end up being more expensive than courses that don't require a lot of resource. But do you, do you see an issue with even pulling out the lower level? Aspects of it because it seems to me that it, in in some courses those tests along the way are built around higher level, more into are integrated in the curriculum at specific points for specific reasons. Right. So when you pull those out and credential them separately, are you? How is that working? There's additional, there's additional credentialing. There's still if so if there's still a synthesis kind of activity where they have to do something with yeah. what they know. They have to either apply it or Create with it. Uh -huh. That that benchmark stays. Uh -huh. So if there if there's a capstone project, right. there's still a capstone project. Right. They wouldn't get that capstone project badge. So the right. thing I like about badges is when you click on that badge, it'll say this is a knowledge level badge that covers the content from soup to nuts. Right. And this person knows the content from soup to nuts. Right. If you wanted, you could say at the bottom of that there's another you know this other badge that requires them to apply that in these contexts. Uh huh. Because we control what displays when you look at the criteria behind right. the badge. Right. So I just say label those things for what they are and still maintain those higher order things. Yeah. Um, and, and you can even have 
knowledge of the, the, the prerequisite information, prerequisite to actually doing you know, the higher order stuff. Right, right. So I, and I see that, you know, basically I'm saying if, that there are things that people can learn on their own and with peer support, and let's let them do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there are things they really need interaction with experts or interaction with peers, and let's control that, and let's, let's do that well. And, you know, that's kind of what we do. So I, I see more people coming through doing the easy stuff on their own, and then we have more time and energy devoted to the higher order stuff. Yeah. So we'd end up with more people coming through for the higher order pieces, and we'd have to charge, you know, at least what it costs us to, to provide that expertise right. and that assessment. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. yeah. So there's some interesting questions coming up, two of which are from Jack, um, that's in, and I think they can be asked together. Um, so what's what's the longer term version of vision for this and and specifically if a, a non Penn Stater takes course yeah. then becomes a Penn Stater right. later on what's the plan is, is there an idea for having retroactive credit given uh, to the individuals so with regard to the second question my uh, if the person took the credit, the credit part of the MOOC uh, the, the mock. Then they were, they're getting Penn State that, that if they enroll, it would just come in. Um, if they just took the MOOC part, then they would not get that because they wouldn't be doing the, all the extra work that, that we're asking them to do for the credit, then they wouldn't get, they wouldn't be retroactively get um, credit, three credits for that at, at that point. Um, with regard to our longer term vision, well, um, I don't know how many people are. How many people? Twenty-five people. I don't know. It seems to me that we're 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 just we're 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 experimenting here. We don't have a grand vision of oh well now all of a sudden we're going to be offering millions of these courses that you know in the college. We're we're thinking can can we do something that has real academic integrity that can generate some revenue um, and and feed back into you know and feed our actually. Our, our, I think our probably more substantive long-term goals are enrollments on the world campus. Um, and so, you know, just the fact that we, we have some evidence that these MOOCs in general f can feed eyeballs to and then enrollments in world campus programs is something that um, uh, is important. And, and I th so in terms of MOOCs, I could imagine our strategy being one that is designed to draw people into the world, to the online programs that we have, in, and and that's why we chose another reason we chose sociology because it's the social science. We have political science already online on the world campus. We have psychology already online in the world campus. So by offering a general uh, uh, general social science um, credit, we are going to hopefully get people who are need general education credit from the wider world, from within Penn State, and from and then potentially people who might be interested. Oh, actually, look, they've got a sociology, they got a psychology program over there. That may be something I want to I want to check out. So, so I, I think in 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 the short run, at least the 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 strategy is to push things to the world campus. Now, I suspect so they that different academic programs will have different motives for doing MOOCs, and that right now we have this one centralized funnel through which all MOOCs have to go. But ultimately, it'll come down to the deans of the college's choice. And one MOOC might be offered because we have a dissemination responsibility from this grant to educate the world about it. Others might be, we have a world campus program, we can use this yeah. as a recruitment. Others might be right. other reasons. So exactly. I, I think that we're at this you know, point in our evolution where we're still watching that yeah. very carefully because it is high yeah. stakes territory. Right. But that ultimately it will become a tool that's right for different programs yeah. for different purposes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm also interested myself in the issue of um, the learning experience on the undergraduate TA side. So, what what kind of experiences are we uh, are we giving these students who are TAing this class? That's a, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to teach into that experience, maybe even to offer credit for that. Uh, depend, so there, there's another side of it that where we where we could give them that, giving them 400 level sociology credit, which we do do for our some of our TAs in sociology. So that's another actually way, uh, theoretically, of, of of generating revenue, but also of giving students really a high level credential 
for the job market and other and other things. So Larry asked uh, for both of you, <clears throat> given all the thought you've put into both of your approaches and what you're going to be offering, what what's risen to the surface as your biggest concern? What are you most worried about? <laughs> you want to go first? You want me to take yeah, that? you go ahead. You go <laughs> first. So I have thought about that. My concern.